Hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we do want to greet you, to welcome you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we are so blessed that you can join us for this time in the Word. We'd like to have you here in person. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, we would love that, yes. yes. But here we are, and this will suffice for the moment. So we're going to continue on in our study that we've been doing for the past three weeks on the call to ministry. And it's an important study because I think far too many Christians don't understand the fact that all Christians, all believers, are called to ministry by God. And I think we've detailed that pretty good in the previous three weeks. So if you've missed that, go to the Bible Talk site, BibleTalk.com, and have a look. Yes. Okay. Do a review of it. Do a review, yes. Um, but in the meantime, what we're going to do, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. And, and this should be the conclusion of that part of the study. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, we're, going to, we're going to talk about the cost and the reward of serving Jesus Christ. But before we do that, before we start, Brother Mark is going to ask God's blessing on our time together. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for the chance that we have to come together and study your word and just make it profitable for us for what we have gotten out of it. Amen. Amen. The call to ministry is a call to serve. I mean, we've talked about that absolutely every time for the past three weeks. And to serve requires basically a dying to self. Yes. And that's the greatest cost. The greatest cost of ministry is self-denial, mm -hmm. picking up your cross daily, following him, denying yourself, because all ministry is founded on, the foundation has to be humility. That's absolutely what, right. Wasn't that the foundation of Christ's ministry? Yes. I mean, if you don't know that, please go read Philippians chapter 2 and see that Christ came here. He humbled himself, humbled himself even to death, even death on a cross. That's right. Okay. So, because what we're doing is we're serving others. We're, but by serving others, our, we're always in the midst of serving God. And that's the foremost. Because by serving God, or by serving others in the name of God, we're serving God. And, you know, Jesus told a parable of, you know, he, he talks about, well, we meet him on that day, and he says, well, you, you clothed me when I was naked, you fed me when I was hungry, you visited me when I was sick, you came to me when I was in prison. And people say, when did we do that? And he said, what you've done to the least of my brethren, you've done unto me. Yes. So when you are serving others, you are serving God, for sure. And I promise you, in that, there's a great reward, all right? But there's also a cost, mm -hmm. okay, that goes both ways. The cost is, is the self. But when Abram, Abraham refused to accept the reward from the world, when the king of Sodom offered it to him, the Lord spoke to him and said, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. That's Genesis 15, 1. And then in 2 Chronicles uh, 15, 7, he said, But you be strong and do not lose courage, for there is reward for your work. In Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then in Revelation twenty two twelve, the last chapter of the Bible, Jesus said, Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Remember that Jesus went to the cross for the joy set before him. Hebrews 12, 2. And we are the joy. We are. So, I mean, in serving, there should be joy in serving. Yes. It should be a blessing. Do you believe, are you a Bible-believing Christian? Are you a Bible-believing Christian? Yeah. Are you a Bible-believing Christian? Mm -hmm. So you believe that it is better and more blessed to give than to receive. Yes. Much more. It says it. <laughs> Jesus said it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it true. is. Uh, it's, it's so. True. Yes. You know, we, we, but we live in a culture and a society. We live in a world, and particularly this is growing in the last days as men become lovers of self, where everything is about what you can get. 
Everything is about what you can receive. Everything is about that. When the greater blessing is to give. Okay? We are to serve the Lord with gladness. We are to come before Him with joyful singing. That's exactly what it says in Psalm 100, verse 2. Now, we're going to go along here. But before we do, I just I want you to understand something. Serving God, being in ministry, is not about your skills or your talent. You have to do it skillfully. But the simple fact of the matter is, it is making yourself available to Him and letting God work through you. Right. You know, Paul said he had learned that mystery, that when he was weak, then he was strong. That was based on his humility, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a poem that I wanted to read, all right? This, uh, you, you Very likely you may have heard this, but if you haven't, if you, ha if you have heard it, it won't hurt you to hear it again. If you haven't hear, heard it, you need to, all right? Okay. This is a, a poem from Myra Brooks Welch that was written back in 1921. And I hope I can, I'm going to have a sip before we go on. Thank you. It's called The Old Violin. T'was battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it hardly worth his while to waste his time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bid, good people, he cried. Who starts the bidding for me? One dollar, one dollar, do I hear too? Two dollars, who will make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three. But no, from the room far back a gray-bearded man came forward and picked up the bow, and wiping the dust from the old violin, tightening up the strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as the angel sings. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, what now am I bid for the old violin, and held it aloft with a bow. One thousand, one thousand, do I hear two? Two thousand, two, who makes it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, going and gone, said he. The audience cheered, but some of them cried. We just don't understand what changed its worth, swift came the reply, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune, all battered and bruised with hardship, is auctioned cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He is going once, he is going twice, he is going and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Amen. You are no more than an instrument in the hands of God. Hallelujah. And God can play sweet music with your life and in your life. It's a truth. Amen. You know, it's we, we, we seem to think that it's all about the person. It's not all about the person. It's all about our God. Everything about this is about our God. So we need to keep that in mind. We absolutely have to keep that in mind. And, and in that, it dawned on me as we were doing this that I do a teaching I, that God gave me over 25 years ago called The Attitude of the Righteous. Yes. And this was a sermon that God gave me a night before I was preaching in a church in, in California. And it was, there are seven things that make for having the attitude of the righteous. Mm -hmm. And if there's one thing you have to have to fulfill your life as a Christian and your ministry as a Christian, it is you have to have the right attitude. Yes, absolutely. You know, I, I mentioned before about Jesus and the picture of him in Philippians chapter 2, mm -hmm. where it says that, you know, he came and he humbled himself even to the point of death. What it says there in Philippians 2 is that we are to have the same attitude as Christ. That we're to have the same mind, depending on the King James says mind, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to think like Jesus, but fortunately we've been given the mind of Christ. And the Lord showed me that if you're going to have that attitude, the right attitude, here's where it comes from, all right? There are seven things. And 
interestingly, the, the message was based on Philippians. Mm -hmm. So all seven things come from the letter Paul's letter to the Philippians. And they all begin with P. <laughs> it's purpose, praise, price, power, perspective, perseverance, and prayer. They're all from Paul. They all begin with P. And they're all in Philippians. How much easier could God make it for you? Right? Simplicity. He is. He's not trying to, you know, I know there are a lot of people out there trying to make God and the things of God and the Word of God very, very complex. Mm -hmm. That's why Paul would write to the Corinthians and say, you know, I'm concerned. Unless the serpent who deceived Eve come along and remove from you the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Right. God's, God doesn't make it hard and complicated for us. And he sent his Holy Spirit into us to lead us into all truth. He's, a, he's equipped us. Yes. But the first one of those things was, and this is foundational, the purpose. Mm -hmm. God says, I know the plans I have for you. He has known the plans for your life from before the foundations of the earth. When he f was forming you in your mother's womb. That's right. But what's the purpose? Why are you here? You know, I've, I've said this a lot. I mean, it's become almost a cliche among those who know me. It's, you know, I'll, I'll, I, I go into a group of pastors where I do teaching and pastors' conferences, and I'll say, how many of you here believe God wants to bless you just mm -hmm. as much as he possibly can? And every hand, pow, shoots straight up in the air. And I say, well, you're going to repent of that before I get through. <laughs> because the simple truth is, if God wanted to bless you as much as he possibly could right now, I'm not going to use the old one, which was, we'll get nuked by North Korea. You drop dead of a heart attack or something, because to live is Christ, to die is gain. God is leaving us here. You know, this is not a nice place, and it's getting not nicer day by day, this old world. Isn't that the truth? Absolutely. The Haven't truth. you noticed? This is I mean, perilous the, the violence. These are, these are the perilous last days. Mm -hmm. To live is Christ. To die is gain. God has a purpose for us here. And it's not because this is a happier place. No. The place we're going is the happier place, all right? What's the purpose that he has for us here? Well, the purpose in your life may be a little bit different than the purpose in my life, but it's called ministry. That's right. It's, we are here to serve the living God. Mm -hmm. You are not here to see if you can get a better job, a nicer car, a bigger house. That's not what this is no, about. No. Unfortunately, that's what the message of so many churches is today, but that's not what it's about. The message is that we are here to serve God. And if you're not doing that, you are going to miss out on the joy of the Lord. Because that's where satisfaction comes. If you're not of the, the kingdom of God, then you're the, of the kingdom of the world. So those things would be for the people that are in the world. Yes, and they are they always disappoint. Yes. They don't satisfy. No. They're they always, never, never satisfy. Always disappointed. So, but the problem is that over time, it seems like Christianity has become a religion that seems to be all about buildings, about traditions, about holidays, about great theological debates that are always followed by great theological disputes and divisions. And all too often about media superstars. That's not what Christianity is about. Okay? I, think about what the Apostle Paul wrote to, in 1 Corinthians 4.20. For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. If you're going to be used by God in ministry, you know what? You've got to have power. You have to have power to accomplish the thing that he has called you to accomplish. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he will never call you to do something that he doesn't equip you to. That's right. But everything that he calls you to requires power of some sort. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. That's why he told the apostles and his disciples, after he had resurrected, he said, don't you leave Jerusalem until power has come upon you. Right? Yes. Because you can't go out there and do this without power. But power, remember my list a minute ago? There's purpose, that's the ministry. Right. And there's praise. praise, because everything has to be done to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. what, whatever you do has to be done to the glory of God. And we are to be a, a formed of people who would declare His praise. And then comes price, 
which we've talked about, mm -hmm. that's followed by power. You're not going to you're not going to see the power without paying the price, and you're not going to you're not even going to be willing to pay the price if you're not a person of praise. If you right. if you're not if your focus is not on Jesus it's Christ, all connected. <clears throat> it is absolutely all connected, and that's why it's so important that you understand this. Okay, because that's what our life is. That's why you're here on this planet. Mm -hmm. If you weren't here on this planet, if he didn't if he wasn't ha didn't have a purpose for you here. You'd get blessed by going home. Right. You know, I, I don't want to get sidetracked here, but I'll, I'll tell you something. That I had the opportunity, after I got saved, to share the gospel with my father, who had yes. been a religious man, but had no relationship with Jesus Christ. And I shared the gospel with him over and over and over. And he one night, he said to me, he said he wanted what I had. And we, we prayed together that he received Jesus Christ. This was over the phone, right? Yes. That was over the phone. I was in New York, and he was in Florida. And every week I would call him and sh and I would talk to him. And of course I would always share what was going on in, in our lives. Our house, share the great things and, that the Lord has done. And that's exactly what we're yeah. doing, talking about the great things that the Lord has done. Yeah. And then this one night, I'm talking to him and he says, he said, I want what you have. I, I want that. Yeah. So I prayed with him and we had a wonderful time of, of prayer. And uh, it ended with me saying I love you, which I always did. I love my father, but, but you never I grew up in a culture where you didn't really, men didn't say that to men, even. Right. Back right? Then. Oh, yeah. And he said to me, praise, praise the Lord. The Lord. Was, those were his last words those, to you. Those were his last words to me. Yeah. And they were last words because the following evening, Alice and I were at a large prayer meeting and I got a telephone call in the middle of the prayer meeting and it was my aunt telling me that she had just gotten news that my father passed away that night. The night he was saved. The night, well, the night, the, right after, he was mm -hmm. saved on one night. And then and the following. The following day. Well, that night he died, yes. Yeah, I didn't find out till the following, the following day. Right. So when I went back out, I'd go in to get the telephone call, and I came back into this room, and there was a couple hundred people there, and I said, I just got word that my father passed away. And there was a very natural reaction, which was, oh. oh. Well, that's a natural reaction. Yes. Because yes. I said to them, what's this oh stuff? I said, you know, he got saved last night when pow zoom straight into the into the, into glory. Amen. He didn't have to put up with. I mean, I've been doing this for over four decades. You know, it's it's a challenge every single day to be out here. It's a blessing. It's a blessing to be able to serve God. But the Word of God says, as I've as I've said, to live is Christ. To die is to gain. die is gain. That's right. Okay. So. We can understand that, that the reason that God hasn't taken us all, because he has purpose for our lives here. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We are the city set upon a hill. We are the only hope that people in the world have, is that they will hear the message, the good news from us. I don't know if you've noticed it, but turn on the news tomorrow morning, and you're not going to see good news. I don't care what channel you, or whether you're, where your focus is, if it's a liberal or a conservative, you're not going to get good news any place. No. Except the in the Word of God. can't give good news. Because they don't have good news. No, they don't. So ministry is always about being that person that is there to bring good news. And when the fruit of the Spirit is at work in your life, and people see the love of God, we're, filled in, we're living in a world that's filled with hate. Yes. And that becomes more evident every day. There's demonic rage out there now. I mean, I, can't, I, mean, I don't even want to get into it, but I mean, it's just so obvious that this group hates that group, that group hates this group, everybody basically so hates much everybody division. out there. Yeah. there. There is. There's division. Mm -hmm. Incredible division. Mm -hmm. This is why we don't need to get involved in that, because what people need to see is love. That's right. And I don't care whether you're a liberal or a conservative. I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican. If you're a Tory or, you know, it doesn't matter what country you're in. Po politics everywhere that I've been, and we've been a lot of places, mm -hmm. is always a mess. The simple fact of the matter is, it's not only about loving the people who love you. Even the Gentiles can do that. Even the unbelievers can do that, Jesus said. It's about your ability to do what the world can't do, and that's love those who hate you. Yes. And people can see. 
they'll, they'll not understand it. And people may be drawn to you to find out why you do that. Why do you pray for your enemies? Why do you love your enemies? You know why? Because God has poured his love into our hearts. Because he loves them. And, and because he told us to, to do it. Mm -hmm. And he gave us the example. Because I'm going to tell you something. God hates sin. Yes, he does. He prayed for sinners. Every sinner. Yes. While he hung on that cross. Yes, he did. Unjustly killed. Right? How do we know what love is? We know love by this. That while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He went to that cross. So that's, that's when what happens is when you don't use that foul language that the world uses now, and it's totally terrible, right? But you're, you have a, a you, the, the tongue of the righteous is as choice silver. It's a fountain of life. When you return a gentle, a gentle answer, answer to a harsh, a harsh word, word, yes. So when you start doing this, people will see the difference in you. And they'll be drawn to that difference. Now, that doesn't mean everybody is. No. But there's somebody. But there's somebody who will see the difference in you. See what a difference the Lord has made in your life. Mm -hmm. And they'll be drawn to say, you know, why is that? And you'll be able to say, it's because of the love of God. Right. And that's the best sermon you can preach. And you don't need to go to the seminary to find that out. No, you don't need no. to go to Bible college to, to find that out. No, I've, I've said this to a lot of people. You know, I've, I've started in pastor churches. And I've had people come up to me and say, well, you know, that person has only been saved so... If you got saved yesterday, I promise you, you know today that God loves you. Yes. You now have enough to go out and preach to somebody else. Go out and tell somebody else that God loves them. Because you weren't special and he's no respecter of men. That's right. He's no respecter of persons. If you know that God loved you and that God died for all people, for all sinners, you know enough to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Do it. You've got to do it. And like I said, you don't have to go stand, bang a, a pail at work and stand up. All you have to do is be living the word. like Christ. Yes. Walking like Christ. Talking like Christ. Let loving the, like let Christ. Let the fruit of the Holy Spirit be evident in your life. If you don't believe that, think about this. The greatest example that I can think of that pops into my mind at the moment is the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. On the day of Pentecost, the people that were gathered praying in that upper room, they didn't run out to the streets and start grabbing people. No. They were just, I mean, the Spirit of God was moving through them, and people came to them. Right? They were drawn. They didn't come into the church. No. But they gathered around it, and Peter went out and preached a sermon that day, and 3,000 were saved. No. You have the tools to do the ministry that God has called you to, whatever he's called you to. And what he has, the, the one thing you need to know, what he has called you to, his purpose in your life, is that you represent him here on this planet. I, you know, it, we, I'm trying to not overdo this, but it boils down to, how it's simple. I mean, does you, should it take you four years of a Bible college to learn this? You're the salt of the earth. Light of the world. You're the light of the world. The world is becoming darker day by day. Mm -hmm. You're the light. Why? Because you carry the light within you. Just be there. Be available. Be available. Yeah. And don't be afraid, afraid to praise him. That was the second thing. That's His right. purpose. Praise. praise. Peter said that we are to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So don't be afraid. I'm going to tell you something. Never be afraid to tell somebody why these good things are going on in your life. Mm -hmm. It's because of Jesus. That's right. That means to praise him. Tell, him. tell him that you serve a mighty God. You serve a God that you love. Praise is not just about singing songs in a church. No. You know, if I tell you that Alice is a wonderful wife, if I tell you that Alice is a wonderful cook, if I tell you how great she is, I'm not singing songs. Oh, maybe my heart is. Yeah. <laughs> but that's Praise. Is it not true? Yes, it is. If I tell you how faithful Mark is as a, as a brother in the Lord, yes. that's praise. Yes. So when you tell somebody that you serve a mighty God, that God is blessing you, you're praising Him. But 
Think about David when he came into Jerusalem, was on his way into Jerusalem, and he was dancing before the Lord. He was a man of praise, and his praise was unabridged. Unab he just praised God. His wife, Michal, it hated says, him. hated him because of that. Yes. Not everybody's going to love you because you praise God. Not everybody's going to love you because you love the Lord. And that becomes the place where you start to pay the price. But once you pay the price, you're going to begin to see the power of God. Yes. And that's what you need to serve God. You can't do it without power. You can, you know, God has given us wisdom. Yes. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? If you don't have wisdom, if you feel like you lack wisdom, well, it's covered in the Word. James said, yes. does any of you lack wisdom? Let him ask of God who gives freely to all men. But wisdom without power is feeble. Power without wisdom is dangerous beyond belief. And I think we're seeing that in the world out there. Yes. People have power, but they, they don't have the wisdom on how to use it. But if you have wisdom and don't have any power, that's just plain feeble. You can't, what are you going to accomplish? And the wisdom of the world is earthly, natural, and demonic. And demonic. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. That's what it says. So and The other thing, the Lord has equipped us with faith. That's when we hear him, it builds our faith. He tells us what to do. And there's the authority. He has given, us, given authority. us authority. And we can't do anything without that authority. The, pow the power is the authority that he's given yes. us. Yes. You know, it's like, I you, know, you can use the example of, if you go into the military, you know, they, they one of the first things they're going to do is they may hand you a weapon. Mm -hmm. They may not give you the bullets. <laughs> Because you haven't been trained yet. And even if they gave you the bullets, now you have, that's a, a weapon is power, is yes. it not? Yeah. Okay? That doesn't mean you can go out and start shooting anybody you feel like. Because you have to be subject to the authority. You can only shoot at the people they tell you to shoot at. So power has to be coupled with that authority. Yes. It has to be coupled with it. And if, if it's going to be about direction, somebody telling you what to do, well, faith comes by hearing. Mm -hmm. Hearing by the Word of God. So those three things, and we're going to talk about this in our next episode. I know that we are. That You know, it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 that a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. Well, that's those three strands. There has to be faith, there has to be authority, and there has to be power. And if you look at a cord that's the three strands and they're entwined, you can't tell which is which. I mean... Right. They be, they, they, in, in effect, one. they become one. Yeah. So those three things have to be at play in our lives. And I think that's what we'll talk about next week because I do want to really get into the meat of looking at living a life filled by the power of God. Oh, yeah. So until then, we just praise you and thank you, Father. We thank you for your, the gift of your Son. We thank you for the example of your Son. We thank you for your Word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. Lord, that we don't have to lean on our own understanding, but that we can be led in all that we do by you, by your Spirit. For those who are being led by the Spirit, they are indeed the children of God. Hallelujah. So, hallelujah. Praise God. Till next week. Yes. Make sure you're back. God bless you and goodbye. Thank you, Jesus, my Savior. Lord, there is none. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every